Akraiser, released in Japan on December 16, 1990 on the Super Famicom, and released in North America in November 1991 the following year on the Super Nintendo, and in Europe March 18, 1993, as a platform city building simulation developed by Quintet and published by Square, now Square Enix. It was soon followed up by the second installment called Actraiser 2, released in Japan on October 29, 1993 on the Super Famicom, November 1993 on the Super Nintendo in North America, and in Europe the following November in 1994. In the Actraiser series, you play as the Master, or in the Japanese version translated literally as God, and your tasks on taking on the evil Tanzra, or translated in the Japanese version, Satan. From the game's booklet, the world is overlooked by the Master and his mission to stop Tanzra from wanting complete control over the world. However, as easy as it may sound, the Master has much bigger hurdles ahead of him, both that differ in the first and second games themselves. In the first game's story, the Master has risen from a deep sleep that lasts hundreds of years. Hundreds of years ago, before the events of the first game, the Master fought against Tanzra and his six guardians in a battle that rendered the Master wounded and had to retreat to a sky palace. Upon awakening, the Master discovers that he has lost all of his strength. His sidekick known as the Angel informs the Master that in his absence, that the people over time had lost faith in the Master during his long slumber thus draining him of all of his strength. Tanzra, on the other hand, also divided the world into six different regions. The foresty land of Fillmore, the once beautiful blood pool that was home to a crystal clear lake, the hot and sandy desert region of Kasandora, the tropical island paradise Maharana, the rocky volcanic plateau Eidos, and the cold northern land of Northwall. Tanzra has sent six of his guardians to take a hold of each region, and it's up to the master and the angel to liberate each land of its monsters, rebuild the population, and restore the faith of the people. These tasks include teaching the populace how to hunt and seal monsters' lairs, learn how to farm, build bridges, to stay warm, and discover hidden relics for their ancient pasts, offer you power-ups during rebuilding of the world, and offerings that will help you in your quest to defeat Tanzra. In Actraiser 2, you take on the role again of the Master. At the beginning of the game, it shows the Master banishing Tanzra out from the heavens, with his body falling to the underworld. Over the course of a thousand years, Tanzra's followers, led by the Seven Deadly Sins, captured his body and proceeded to resurrect him. Upon Tanzra's resurrection, he unleashes the Seven Deadly Sins upon the world, along with his legion of demons. The Master must take on Tanzra's legion and save humanity once again. It is also revealed why Tanzra has hatred towards the Master as he was one of his servants and was banished from heaven for starting a rebellion against heaven. Tantra still is referred to both as the Evil One and Satan in the Japanese version. The regions of these lands also reflect what each sin tarnishes. Diligence, a town of people who over time began to lose the will to work. The deadly sin Sloth's presence can be felt here. Devote. A kingdom once ruled by a queen whose jealousy of her lover consumed her and cursed anyone whose beauty exceeded hers. The deadly sin Envy's presence can be felt here. Temponia. A place where people who lived extravagant lifestyles that began overconsuming everything. The sin of Gluttony's presence can be felt here. Justania and Favorian. Two neighboring kingdoms who were at peace until the kingdom of Justania attacked Favorian. Justania, famously known for his army, attacks Favorian at the death field, where we learn that the deadly sin Wrath's presence is felt in the volcano Almetha. Loveus, a kingdom who has fallen under a frozen curse from a king's sudden slumber, has been taken under the influence of a demon called Deception. The deadly sin Lust's presence can be felt here. The Kingdom of Leon, where a king has raised the taxes high and filled his castle full of gold. The deadly sin Greed's presence can be felt here. And Humbleton, a city where people who have advanced technology who want to become masters themselves have begun building a Tower of Souls, or in the Japanese version, the Tower of Babel, to reach the heavens. The deadly sin Pride's presence is felt here. Upon finishing the Tower of Souls, Death Heme appears, and much like in the first installment, the master must go and have a final showdown with Tanzra to liberate the land once again of Tanzra's influence. In terms of tones of both games, the first game and the second game seem to have two different moods that go with it. But the very first game, there seems to be a lot more ephemerality to it, though, where the second, in Act Razor 2, seems to have a lot more serious and darker tones and darker themes to go with it. It should also be noted that Tanzer's generals from the first and the second game 
differ, whereas in the second game, they're based off of the Seven Deadly Sins, having more of a Judeo-Christian theme to it, whereas in the first game, it seems to borrow from other religions and other mythologies as well. Now in this video, I'm going to be looking at a few points that I believe prove that Act Racer 2 is a prequel to the first game. Some of these clues break the fourth wall, others take a look at the evolution of the protagonist, the master himself. Others look through the settings of both games and the series' main antagonist. So without further ado, let's go ahead and delve into it. The Mastery of the Master From the first look at the title, Act Razor 2, the number two meaning that it's meant to come off as a sequel to the first game. However, it's heavily hinted that Act Razor 2 is a prequel to the first game. Some franchises tend to produce sequels to make more money and expand more on the stories. But it also expands on the narratives of the characters and different points of the series that tie it together. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's writing a second chapter taking place after the first installment. For some, it tells origin stories when it goes back to paint a bigger picture of the narrative already being told. In Act Razor 2, there's a handful of subtle hints that suggest that Act Razor 2 is the first chapter in the story. When you look at the protagonist in both games, you'll quickly notice the builds on the master. In the first installment, the master is seen holding a two-handed sword, have what appears to be a small mask with wings at each end. He also seems to be wearing armor very similar to a Roman Empire-like design covering his body, with metal gauntlets on his hand and also wearing blue cloth from his shoulders down to his knees, where his leg armor and boots are visible. You'll notice that the master runs and jumps fast and is able to cast only one selected spell equipped from heading into the stages. In Act Razor 2, the Master's figure is much larger and much more physically defined. He's only wearing a long cloth similar to a barbarian, albeit a little bit more elegant in design too. His speed and agility is cut in half in terms of quickness. He comes equipped with seven different spells that he can cast. He also comes equipped with a shield that allows him to block projectiles high, low, and from an upper angle. He also has wings that allows him to glide down and dive on enemies. His sword also allows him to attack at low and high angles too. Now this begs the question, why the change? It does make sense that the master's physical appearance is much more beefier and could be attributed to the simple explanation of growing stronger over time, much like working out or just training in general. However, when the master faced off against Tantra in the events leading to the first game, his weakened state could have attributed to his smaller frame and high agility. But what about being able to access his complete list of magic spells as opposed to having them ready at will? It could be possible that the master learned only to use the magic needed in specific situations. It also has a connection to you, the player, playing as the master for you yourself, accessing what you need to be successful, because sometimes every situation is different. This also begs the question of the defeat in battle. Now defeat in battle sometimes renders us unable to be as effective, most importantly as before. Said person could lose a limb in battle, have shell shock or PTSD, could wear down our mental focus and rewire our reflexes to react differently. But there is always a balance that comes to adversity, and when it comes to adversity, we've got something to overcome. We can become stronger in defeat, be more cunning, and approach situations differently to attain victory. I believe this is how the Master in Act Razor 2 differs from the first game in terms of prequel formula. Simplicity in defeating Tanzara is evolving from defeat. I should also note in the first game that the spells that the Master cast doesn't just come from within him or his sword. In Act Razor 2, the Master's magic is very much short range but also can range to minor to major damage. But in the first game, the Master's magic can not only come from within, but it can also be summoned from the skies like the Sardis spell and can cover higher ground to do multiple hits on multiple enemies, or just one enemy itself, albeit in comparison probably not as strong but it's more consistent. It's tough to truly decide if this was intentionally done by the developers but not to me. It makes the most sense in forms of how much better it is and how much better the master controls it in the first game and is easier to utilize in difficult situations that could be dicey. Bigger doesn't necessarily mean better, but even when it comes to simplicity, it makes for much easier in terms of learning gameplay. The World When you first take the helm in the clouds and move the Sky Palace, it's very easy to notice how different the world is in both games. In Act Razor 2, moving the palace around, you'll quickly see there are civilizations around. The kingdoms of Justania, Favorian, Levaeus, Leon, and the advanced civilization of Humbleton. They all show bustling growth as if they've existed for centuries. Sure, there are imperfections to any civilization, but when you start in the first game, you notice that there are no cities, villages, towns, or any kind of civilizations around. In the first game, 
the master must liberate the monsters in each region so that it can become habitable for the people to live in. Like I mentioned earlier in the video, repopulating the world and regaining the faith of the people restores your long lost strength, but it also allows you to get to know the people with their trials and tribulations. A generation of people who learn that the master exists is a culture shock, not just to them but to the populace in general as they learn that, well, God exists. And at the mercy of regaining their faith for your strength, over time in return you perform many miracles, not just many miracles but as many miracles as you can. You also teach them how to survive until they're self-sufficient and they no longer need to rely on you. So how else does this theory prove that Act Razor 2 is a prequel? Though Act Razor 2 does not feature the simulation portion of the first game, it's very much assumed that the people know that the Master exists. But there is no mention in the dialogue during the game while going from region to region that no one is praying for the Master. This being more prominent when you reach Humbleton, a civilization wanting to be masters themselves, or in this case, gods amongst men and women. However, during the ending of Act Razor 2, there are quotes that aptly say, Thank you, Master, for giving us good crops this year. A woman looks to the sky and whispers and says, Please help me find someone special. Enter Act Razor, the very first game. No faith in the Master, Tantra's influence in the world, a weakened god needing to regain faith of his people, weaken but to be rebuilt to save humanity once again. How strong is Tanzra? Every antagonist has to be the force that has to be feared by all, and should shudder when they hear their name. Tanzra, or Satan in this case, known as the Evil One, is the enemy responsible for dividing the world into six regions and has influenced the world into uninhabitable conditions with his legions in control of every region. The final battle takes place east of Northwall, out at sea between a trio of small islands where Death Heme appears. After taking on Tanzra's resurrected guardians, the Master finally faces off against Tanzra. Tanzra's initial appearance is like his demonic face, like the appearance in the hub before you fight all the rest of the battles in Death Heme. However, after defeating him, he returns and transforms into a much more wicked, stronger, demonic-like skeleton form with long talon claws and a blue core that doubles as his weak point and another beam attack at his disposal. In Act Razor 2, during the opening movie we see the Master in Heaven fighting off Tanzra's henchmen as he leads a rebellion against you. He appears as a smaller version of his final form from the first game. As he is defeated and banished from Heaven, we learn that Tanzra has been resurrected deep within the underworld by his followers which we learn later on in the final battle that he is in Death Heme, half frozen waist deep and is much bigger in size compared to his appearance in the first game. Now this also begs the question, if Tanzra was not encased in ice, would his powers have been much more destructible? Would he himself have the power to wound the master out of ease? Would he most likely have been at his absolute pinnacle power? The easy answer in this case would definitely be yes. Without a doubt he would have, but even during the ending of Act Razor 2, even through the beginning of the story he said he was resurrected by his followers, would it have been this form that it wounded the master along with his six generals? Even after awakening from his slumber, regaining his strength and the faith of the people, would his final form in this game be considered to be stronger than his final form in the second game, even without him being encased in ice? It's really up to interpretation, but from this theory I do believe this to be true. In terms of size, Tanzra is definitely much bigger in the second game. It's really the only form that we know him as, or what we see. But when you read up on how Tanzra and his six generals in the first game wounded the master, or as the angel says, sealed his power, the inconsistencies that clash with what's mentioned do have one thing in common. It wounds the protagonist. So, if the protagonist was not wounded in the first game, let's just say that, you know, in this context, in this context, the theory of the first game being the second and the second game being the first, what would you agree on? Let's take a look at one of my favorite games, Brave Friends Musashi. The final boss, Dark Lumina, is about half as tall as the main character. And by the way, Musashi is a kid. Dark Lumina is about half a foot taller than Musashi with an all-white body. Red jewel-like eyes with a red jewel on his forehead. Everything about him screams total package when it comes to his magic, speed, strength, and his deceptive tactics. Especially when it comes to deceiving you. Even Dark Lumina's transformation really goes to show just how condensed his power really is. Everything all just hit in this small package right here. Everything you expect to come out of him will come out of him. And when you least expect it, boom, you underestimate him, and then you die. Tanzra in the first game, though, has two forms. 
just a face and his true form. Interestingly enough though, Tantra's true form in the first game almost compares in size to his true form in the second game. Then again, it is modeled after his final form in the first game. Now in conclusion, it's really up to interpretation at this point. I'm sure there's some things that I missed that connect the two games chronologically and that could have gotten more explanation. Regardless if the game story could have mentioned it, maybe there's some tidbits that I may have missed out and trust me, this comparison, I will agree, is probably not a perfect example. But these are just a few things as a fan that I tried pointing out. And a few things that I noticed too. I hope you all enjoyed this video. I had a lot of fun doing it. This is also my very first attempt at doing a theory-based video too. I hope my research and my points connect well and I hope to make more in the future too. But on that note, I'm going to go ahead and sign off from here. Much love and uh, peace!